I am an old man. I live here in this ancient house surrounded by huge unkempt gardens. The peasantry who inhabit the wilderness beyond say that I'm mad. That is because I will have nothing to do with them. I live here alone with my old sister, who is also my housekeeper. We keep no servants. I hate them. I have one friend. A dog. Yes, I would sooner have old Pepper than the rest of creation together. He at least understands me, and has sense enough to leave me alone when I'm in my dark moods. I have decided to start a kind of diary. It may enable me to record some of the thoughts and feelings that I cannot express to anyone, but beyond this, I'm anxious to make some record of the strange things that I have heard and seen during many years of loneliness in this weird old building. HPPodcraft.com You have just heard the beginning of a very strange story indeed from the novel The House on the Borderland, a classic of weird fiction by William Hope Hodgson. And you are listening to us discuss it here on the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. At hppodcraft.com, I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And I'm Chris Lackey. And uh, who was that reader we just heard there? You know him. You can't help but love him. <laughs> John Hancock. <laughs> now, we're going to be going through this book pretty fast. You read this whole, almost this whole book today, you were telling me. I did read pretty much the whole book today. I read about <laughs> the first five or six chapters early on, and then today I sat down and just said, I have to get it done. Yeah. I was having a tough time with one of the chapters, and then... It got really good. Yeah. And then it gets really crazy. It has that vibe of uh, Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, where at point I was going, no, dude, this is your job. You have to stick with this. <laughs> yep. And yeah. I would be rewarded by something crazy. Yeah. But you really had to, to hang in there. That talk we had with Lehman last week was really fun. Man, I really enjoyed just sitting down and chatting with Lehman about a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I couldn't believe it had been so long since we had him on to do that kind of thing. That's a crying shame. It is. It's a crying shame. It's a crime that I think you should serve some time for. What? But since we do have so much to cover, why don't we do a little bit about the author now? Yeah. So we know who we're dealing with, and then uh, and then we'll jump into it. So William Hope Hodgson, what do you know? He's English. He mm-hmm. was born in Essex, son of an Anglican priest. He moved around a bunch when he was little. Yeah. He would go to different churches wherever his father was needed. It's 11 different parishes in 21 years. And he en- ended up staying in uh, County Galway, or Galway, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, in Ireland, where this is actually set. Yeah, so he has some firsthand experience with this area. And that is the strongest Gaelic-speaking population in Ireland still to this day. I know, which is funny because isn't it, doesn't that make it the largest Gaelic speaking population in the world? Yeah. Is there is. like a pocket in Tennessee I don't know about or something? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they still teach school to everybody in Gaelic. There. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think about 20% of the population still uses it in regular conversation, which is pretty cool. Glad yeah. to see that that's sticking around. Hodgson ran away at age 13 from boarding school trying to go off to sea. He kind of wanted to be a sailor. It reminded me a little bit of Frederick Marriott, that author we talked right? about before, who uh-huh. kept trying to run away. He got caught that first time, but eventually his father allowed him to go. He died actually shortly after Hodgson left for His sea. father did. Yeah, his father not, did. Not Hodgson. Not Hodgson, no. He actually spent the next four years as an apprentice at sea. He came back, got some more education, I think, in Liverpool, and then he went out again. And those years at sea were very formative for him. Apparently, from what I've read, he was actually kind of scared of the ocean. Yeah, that seems like a weird choice for somebody that's scared of the ocean to become a sailor. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're trying to conquer your fear. Maybe he didn't know when he got into it. Oh, right. How terrifying it was going to be and what a brutal life it actually is. A lot of things that he wrote later had to do with that experience at sea and the horrors at sea of the storms, of the conditions that they had to deal with. He also had to deal with quite a bit of bullying while he was in the service. I heard about that because he's a pretty good looking dude. He's a pretty good looking guy. And he was a bodybuilder. Yeah. In that time. I had just read. It's funny because I just read an article about Henry Rollins, you know, of Black Flag fame. As I well. do. He's such a built guy. And it was the same reason for him. He got bullied a lot when he was a kid. And some gym teacher said, we'll start doing this every day and nobody will bully you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and so he started working out. Now, Sam Moskowitz, I don't know if you've heard of him before, but he's kind of a famous science fiction fan. Uh, yeah. He was a fan of Hodgson, and this is what he had to say. The primary motivation of Hodgson's body development was not health, but self-defense. His relatively short height and sensitive, almost beautiful face made him an irresistible target for bullying semen. When they moved in to pulverize him, they would learn too late that they had come to grips with easily one of the most powerful men, pound for pound, in all of England. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jeez. He was so into it that when he got back from seeing his early 20s, he actually opened up a school. It was called W.H. Hodgson School of Physical Culture. Uh, this was in Blackburn, England. Oh, right. Yeah, that's up here. That's really close. Uh, my wife's granny lives in Blackburn. Well, he would train for the local police force, get them 
you know, he eventually had to close the school because it was seasonal and he couldn't make an income from it. Right. But uh, he wrote a lot of articles about physical fitness, and you can find some of these, I think, still that have photos of him demonstrating the exercises. Yeah. Uh, kind of workout and men's health kind of thing. <laughs> so I think this might be the first author we've covered who started writing weird fiction because personal training didn't work out for him. <laughs> Are you sure Guy didn't Maupassant? try personal training? Yeah. <laughs> it's possible. I think he might have. Now, there was this incident only briefly mentioned in the Wikipedia article I was reading about him uh-huh. that he had a problem with Houdini in 1902. There's some kind of grievance? Well, Houdini came to town to demonstrate. This is when he was touring around England and he was he said basically, bring your own cuffs. Lock mm-hmm. me up and I'll get out of them. And when they came to that part of town, they elected Hodgson to be the guy to put the cuffs on him. Right. And I don't know what Hodgson's opinion of Houdini was, but apparently he didn't like him very well because mm-hmm. he came with a, a bodybuilding assistant and apparently he gummed up the locks on the cuffs. Oh, no. And he wrapped, uh, wrapped them in wire or something like that. So even with a key, you would have a hard time getting them undone. Oh, my gosh. And Houdini said, protested this and said, hey, man, you tampered with these. And Hodgson yeah. was like, hey, you said bring whatever. These are my cuffs. And he said, OK, I'll, I'll work it out. So they locked him up. But this bodybuilder basically just pulled his arms behind him so tight that immediately all the circulation went out of Houdini's body. I mean, everybody saw this. Oh, no. Bound him up so tight, put the cuffs on. Then they put him behind the curtain. And, I, you know, like 45 minutes later, he still wasn't out of this thing. I think they had to open it several times, give him water, kind of help him stand. But he, oh, my God. He actually asked at one point, can you take them off? Give me a second to put them back on because I'm dying, but they wouldn't do it. This went on so long, the crowd got really unruly. Finally, late at night, he burst out. He had gotten the cuffs undone. He was bloody. Oh, my God. He had scratches all up and down his arms. And Hodgson had left by that point. But the whole crowd turned on Hodgson. They were angry with him. Of course. Him. Yeah. <laughs> because they were there for a spectacle, and he seriously inconvenienced, or not inconvenienced, he seriously made it impossible for who needed it. Right. Do it. I'm not liking Hodgson right now <laughs> Well, after that story. He was young. I think he just wanted to prove this guy isn't magical. I mean, can he really do this? Yeah. He did it, but it was it was a poor show. Anyway, eventually, as I said, he had to close the school, turn to writing fiction, and that's what he dedicated much of his life to afterward. He did return to the military when the war broke out, though. Yeah, he became a, a artillery man, mm-hmm. and he ended up getting in an accident, uh, busted his jaw on his face, and mm-hmm. he was discharged. No choice. He was out out of the war. Right. World War One is what we're talking about yes. here. He got better. And this is the crazy thing. He re-enlisted. Yeah. And when he re-enlisted, he got killed by an artillery shell. 1918. That makes him kind of sound a little bit more badass that he took a licking and then waited till he got better and went right back into one of the bloodiest wars of all time. Yeah. And not, not on the sea either. He was not going to go back to that field. He no. wanted to be out there. Yeah, out there fighting. So, and he and he paid for it. He did with his life at forty. Pretty crazy life and a short one. We can talk about what Lovecraft thought about Hodgson in this novel when we're all done. I think it's probably the yeah. best time to do that. We'll save that for later. I, I, I was thinking about it this weekend. I went to go see that X Men movie. Finally, the new one. Oh, he did. Yeah. You know, in those movies, how Professor X always puts Cerebro on. Uh huh. There's that moment where he looks out and it's this kind of red mist, and you see all these images, shapes of people, and some of them are uh-huh. more brightly lit. And you hear the the sounds of their conversations flowing by you and all these kinds of things. It reminded me a lot of this novel. We're, we're used to those kinds of CGI effects. You can just sit there right. and watch them. But we're talking about something written at the beginning of the 20th century. That kind of thing wasn't available. Hodgson had the kind of mind in which he wanted to describe all of those things to you. And in this mm-hmm. novel, it feels as if he is describing in minute detail a gigantic CGI effect, doesn't it? Well, not not the whole story. Not the whole story. But there there are portions of it that feel like if you had to sit down and describe everything that you saw in that Cerebro scene in X-Men yeah. to the detail yeah. for a reader, you know that would take you quite a bit of time. You'd have to describe each figure, each noise, each passing thing. It would. Just as a caution to readers when you get into this, that that's what you're dealing with. A lot of authors will only suggest things and let you work it out. Hodgson's not ready to do that. When it comes to the trippier aspects of the books, he, he, he wants to paint absolutely every detail for you. Yes. So some of those chapters I think you're referring to that are hard to get through, that's what's going on. They are, man, they are tough. <laughs> I, I mean, gosh, yeah. I, it was, I did feel a little bit of dream quest and going, I've got to keep going. I've got to just read it. Just read it. Yeah. Don't think about how much you're not getting it or liking it. Just read the words. <laughs> And I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. For um, well, I'm proud of you, too. Thank you. Now, this is a kind of a found footage novel. It is. 
starts off with an introduction where it's Hodgson himself saying this is from a manuscript that was found by these two guys, Mr. Tonneson and Berignog. Mm-hmm. And they found them in the ruins that lie to the south of the village of Creighton in the west of Ireland. Yeah. So the, the author's sort of a character himself saying, I have this now mm-hmm. and I'm going to show it to you. Although the first chapter is about the discovery of the manuscript. So it's a nested story once again. Three levels. The author, the discoverers of the manuscript, and then the actual story. Also, right in the beginning of the book, there's an inscription. It's a poem that Hodgson dedicated to his father, who, as we said, had died shortly after, your, after he'd left for sea. Yeah. The poem says, to my father, whose feet tread the lost eons. Um, Hodgson did write poetry. Most of it didn't get published. I think that in the last few years, some different companies have actually published collections of his poetry. But at the time, the only way you could really get it out was by putting it in as an inscription for one of his books. Right. In the introduction where he talks about the manuscript, there's a couple of, it's a really short where he's just saying, I've looked this over quite a few times. It blew my mind. I think it might blow your mind, but if it doesn't, at least it's a fun read. (laughs) <laughs> but a couple of lines that I like in the uh, intro, he says, I have the queer, faint, pit water smell of the manuscript in my nostrils now as I write. And my fingers have subconscious memories of the soft, cloggy feel of the long, damp pages. I read and in reading lifted the curtains of the impossible that blind the mind and looked out into the unknown. I thought it was a good passage because it gives you this. You're about to read the manuscript and it kind of gives you context for what the manuscript even smells like, you know? Yeah. No, it's good. The first chapter is simply called The Finding of the Manuscript. It introduces Berignog, who's the narrator, mm-hmm. and his pal Tonison. And Tonison has been out of the village of Creighton previously. He stumbled across it accidentally, thought it would be a great place for them to go fishing. Yeah. So they're going to take a camping trip, do a little fishing. There's a little river that flows right through there. It'll be nice, very out of the way. Good place to be. They take a tough journey to get there because they're English, obviously, Mm -hmm. to get to Ireland and get to the small town. It it takes a long time. So they they do it. They have a driver that drops them off and he's going to come back in two weeks and pick them up. They make camp, do some fishing, have a great time. They meet some townspeople, but they can't talk to them because, like we said at the top of the show, they speak Gaelic. And these two guys, being Englishmen, don't. But they give them some some of the fish that they've caught. The townspeople seem to like them and they don't bother them. Yeah. They leave them the fish. Now... You read the graphic novel version of this as well. Didn't I you? did. Yeah, I I read that. Um, honestly, I read it before mm-hmm. I read this, and it's very, very different. It was it's drawn by Richard Corbin, who did a lot of heavy metal artwork. Right, right. If you're familiar with him, he did Den, which mm-hmm. was adapted in the movie Heavy Metal. Do you remember that's the the bald guy, John Candy, did the voice. I do remember that. Okay, so that's the artist. That yeah, guy. that seems like a, an appropriate choice of artist as well. It's much different. The story starts off where these guys get in a fight with them, and then they're on the run from the townspeople, and then they end up in these ruins and find the book. So it's very different. Uh, I don't quite know why those decisions were made in that graphic novel, why it's different. There's lots of differences in there. But uh, I'll, I'll bring it up. The artwork's beautiful. I love Richard Corbin's stuff. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've ordered it, but I, I don't know when I'm going to get it. So hopefully at some point while we're covering this. Uh, anyway, they fish for most of a week, and um, they go down this one part of the river. And then finally, one day, I think it's a Sunday, they go, let's go the other direction. Yeah. See what's down on the river that way. They follow it, and they find that the river suddenly just is gone. It goes underground, which is pretty strange. Yeah. They hear rushing, and they see this mist, and they assume that it must there must be a waterfall that's somewhere. So they keep looking for wherever it comes out. You know, they think since it goes underground, maybe it pops out just nearby yeah. because of this mist. When they get around, they find this giant chasm where water's bursting out and it's dropping hundreds of feet below. So low, they can't even really see how far it's going. But the weirdest thing about it is that there is this huge ruin, a structure, some kind of house on the other side. And it's in a really weird location, right? It says it was undoubtedly a portion of some ruined building Yet now I made out that it was not built on the edge of the chasm, but perched at an extreme end of a huge spur of rock that jutted out some 50 or 60 feet over the abyss. It's, in fact, the jagged mass of ruins literally suspended in midair. It's a really surreal kind of image of this giant hole in the earth. I I assume just this jutting out rock and then the ruin is out in the middle of it. Yeah. Pretty strange. They they follow that jut of rock out to the ruin. Pretty brave. Yeah, pretty brave, especially because <laughs> I'm imagining all the spray is making all the rock really wet and damp. So I kept worrying somebody was going to fall. Tonneson finds the manuscript and the rocks around the ruin. They tuck it away to have a look at it later. Take it back to their camp. But as they're examining the ruin, they also start to feel like there are presences around. 
Yeah. Something's looking at them. When they get back to the camp, they start, uh, they look at it. The manuscript has a title and it says the house on the borderland, Mm -hmm. which is obviously the title of this story. Yeah. And it gets us to the actual tale and that opening bit that we heard at the beginning of the episode that John read for us. Yeah. That's the opening of the actual story, the house on the borderland. So we've got this old man who introduced himself. He's unnamed for the entire story. Lives in this ancient house. Uh, We're going to assume that it's the ruin they found is of that house. Mm -hmm. And he lives there with his dog. Uh, Pepper. Played by Nathan Lane. Who's p- <laughs> who in your head was played by Nathan Lane throughout this uh, book. Yeah. And then his sister, who's a somewhat elderly spinster type. She's a lone servant. Uh, other than that, he's alone. Yep. And this house has had a bad reputation for a couple of centuries. So he got it at a real good price. And he's not a superstitious person, even mm-hmm. though the people say that this place was allegedly built by the devil because it's, <laughs> <laughs> it looks pretty crazy. It's actually the, the whole building itself is kind of round and the outlines of it suggest leaping flames. Yeah. You know, there's towers, there's there's pinnacles, all that. It's, it's pretty cool looking, creepy building. I love that myth that the devil built the house because immediately <laughs> I think of the practical concern. You know, did he just build it all at once or did he have to get some contractors in and argue with them and, you know. <laughs> oh, no, he worked on it himself. <laughs> I see the devil out there with all these rolls of parchment and he's got a pencil behind his ear and he's just yeah. frustrated because nothing, you know, the bathroom tile's mm. not been laid in time. For years living in this house, he didn't see anything really odd. Yeah, for a long time. Then suddenly things start happening. He's careful to say, I'm going to tell you the first incident that I experienced that's odd. It didn't happen on Halloween. You might expect (laughs) if I was pulling your, you know, pulling your leg that I would say, oh, it was Halloween night. But it wasn't. It was just some average day near the end of January that I had this strange experience where he was in his study. He spends most of his time in his study reading. And without warning, two of the candles go low. And then suddenly blast out this kind of ghastly green effulgence, he calls it. The dog starts freaking out. And then this crimson light kind of starts piercing the room. This really got set up for me like a haunted house story. Yeah, I didn't think that when I was reading it. I just for me, it seemed like something I was ready for the weird because I knew that this story was very nutty. I, I didn't quite know that, really. Other than people writing in to say we were going to like this and that it was really weird. I didn't know how... I I hate using this word, but I didn't know how trippy it was. Right. I thought that the way this is all set up is I've experienced some odd occurrences. I thought he was going to start talking about the normal stuff we cover. There's a ghost. There was some thing in the shadows. And instead he goes right into the room, starts glowing. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at all of this red light. And then suddenly I'm staring through the wall beyond. And then I realize I'm looking out onto this vast plane. So it goes right into this hallucination. Yeah, it's a vision, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't expect that. This was an amazing ride for me at this point still. Right, yeah. No, I'm still still into it. This is the part, though, where things, because this goes on for a while, this vision that he has here. And and this (laughs) is where I started to be concerned that the whole story is like this. Yeah. Because it goes on, and like you said, a lot of detail, and personally I felt like a lot of unnecessary detail in this painting that he's trying to to describe to us. This. But I admire the um, the thoroughness that he's doing it with. If it wasn't enjoyable, at least I admire that, if that makes sure. sense. <laughs> no, no, I, I appreciate that, but I wasn't enjoying it. I hear you. He's looking out at the redness at this vast plane, and then he realizes he's no longer in his chair. He's kind of hovering above it, mm-hmm. and then he starts moving, and it's that kind of movement, you know, like you're on the people mover at the airport. You're not really, <laughs> you know, he's just right. kind of drifting along, onward, outward, Skipping a bunch of things. Basically, he's out in almost space. Well, yeah, it's clouds. There are these red clouds that he sort of goes into, and that sort of obscures his vision, and then it comes out into, like, a night sky. But there's this ring of red fire Mm -hmm. that is going from one side of the sky to the other side of the sky. And there's flames, and it's, it's moving back and forth. It's pretty intense. I mean, this is kind of like end of the world vision kind of stuff. Yeah, this celestial body he describes, it's like a black planet almost with all these flames shooting out around it in a ring, almost like the Eye of Sauron or something like that. I yeah, I did think of the Eye of Sauron. <laughs> and as he's going forward with that on the horizon, he sees this chain of great mountains that he suddenly plunges toward. And that's the mm-hmm. end of that chapter. It gets us into the third, which is called the House in the Arena. Once he gets to this area, he calls it the amphitheater because it's surrounded by these mountains. So when he gets there in the center of it, this big arena, this amphitheater, there is a a big, huge structure made of green jade. Now, he, looking at it, he thinks that it looks very similar, if not identical, to his house mm-hmm. where he's living. But 
it's different and it's made of this weird green stuff. Yeah. And I started to get it here. So he's it's some kind of different dimension. That house exists there, too. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. And he's crossed over somehow. Now, as he's looking up along the slopes of the mountains, he starts seeing some. Well, this stuff blew me away, too. He starts seeing some weird stuff. And then, as I peered curiously, a new terror came to me. For away up among the dim peaks to my right, I had descried a vast shape of blackness, giant-like. It grew upon my sight. It had an enormous equine head with gigantic ears and seemed to peer steadfastly down into the arena. There was that about the pose that gave me the impression of an eternal watchfulness, of having warded that dismal place through unknown eternities. Slowly, the monster became plainer to me, and then suddenly my gaze sprang from it to something further off and higher among the crags. For a long minute, I gazed fearfully. I was strangely conscious of something not altogether unfamiliar, as though something stirred in the back of my mind. The thing was black and had four grotesque arms. Round the neck, I made out several light-coloured objects. Slowly, the details came to me, and I realised, coldly, that they were skulls. Further down the body was another circling belt, showing less dark against the black trunk. Then, even as I puzzled to know what the thing was, a memory slid into my mind. And straight away, I knew that I was looking at a monstrous representation of Kali, the Hindu goddess of death. Yikes. How did that strike you? I was into that. Suddenly, he because there was that first thing that he saw, the beast-headed thing, and mm-hmm. he realizes that's the Egyptian god Set. Mm-hmm. He's thinking back through his old student days. He, he knows the stuff, and he says to himself, oh my goodness, it's the old gods of mythology. And then as he looks, he sees there's actually a ton of these things up in the mountains. That the whole mountain range that's surrounding this area, that it's huge, but the mountains all contain these old gods. The mountains were full of strange things, beast gods, and horrors so atrocious and bestial that possibility and decency deny any further attempt to describe them. And I, I was filled with a terrible sense of overwhelming horror and fear and repugnance. Yet in spite of these, I wondered exceedingly, was there then... After all, something in the old heathen worship, something more than the mere deifying of men, animals, and elements? The thought gripped me. Was there? I guess is the implication that these things actually do exist in some other dimension because they were created by us? Or were they created by us because they live in some other dimension and they were somehow perceived by people like him in places like this? (laughs) I don't know. Pretty trippy. And then he starts moving toward the house once he's noticed this. Right. Very slowly, slowly moving towards it. And then as he's getting there, he catches something else in his vision that comes, it's something that like comes around the house into his full view. It was a gigantic thing and moved with a curious lope, going almost upright after the manner of a man. It was quite unclothed and had a remarkable luminous appearance. Yet it was the face that attracted and frightened me the most. It was the face of a swine. We got a green pig man. Yeah, I thought the Monster Party 2014 was over for the time being. But apparently we've moved on to pig men. We got green pig men. So, Gamorrean guards. That's all I could think about. (laughs) And for those who don't know, the Gamorrean guards are the pig creatures from uh, Return of the Jedi. I guess we are still technically then in a, that's a type of monster, a pig man. Yeah. I can't think of any movies other than Return of the Jedi that feature pig men. Motel Hell. Oh, Wasn't yeah. there a guy that wore a pig's head? Oh. It wasn't actually a pig-headed person, but it was a dude wearing a pig's head, at least on the poster. I didn't see the movie because the poster scared me so much. <laughs> well, that's enough to say this is a themed month, so uh, from here on out, let's call it the Pork of July. <laughs> what do you think of that? <laughs> Done. All right, sweet. The thing turns, this pig guy, and yeah. looks up at him. And then opens its mouth, and it's been very still up till now, and then releases this horrible, booming sound. Yeah. And then starts coming toward him. It's a little scary here, right? Like, he, against his will, is being pushed toward the thing. Yeah, but he starts lifting up, going higher and higher into the the sky. Mm -hmm. And until he's, like, maybe 100 feet up, and beneath the spot that he just left, the the pig creature is underneath him. Yeah. It's gone on all fours, and it's kind of, you know, sniffing around, trying to find him. 
Yeah. Like it didn't it didn't realize that he went straight up in the air or something like that. Things start getting more trippy again. He realizes that he's still rising away from the plane and getting further and further. Then there's this just red mist again that he's sort of engulfed inside. Right. Which concludes that and gets us into the next chapter, which simply is called The Earth. Long story short, he flies basically away from there. He sees the sun, a cloud of flame, and then a bunch of planets from the solar system and then the earth and he flies in towards the earth and then there's this kind of he sinks into what feels like this black mist and then he feels something li- like wet on his hand something licking his hand as he instinctively moves away again he feels it happen again mm-hmm. he pulls pu- pulls his hand and then he realizes it's nathan lane <laughs> trying to get his attention and barks at him <laughs> <laughs> it's it's Pepper, uh, the dog who barks yes. at him, and we see that he is back in his old familiar study. So either at this point, I thought he had crossed over into some dimension, but then the fact that he had to go back through space to get here was all really confusing to me. It was pretty strange. I just rolled with it when I read it. I rolled with it. And when you read the whole book, actually, and then look at this, he actually did a, a much faster version of a trip that he again takes later. I think he actually went through time. As, as well. Well, what happens here is he looks up at the clock and realizes once the dog kind of gets him awake, time has passed. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, it's passed the other the other way because he remembers looking at the clock and it was after two. And now he's looking at the clock and it's before midnight. Yeah. And he thinks, wait, did I travel back in time somehow? Right. When I read this, I inst- instinctively thought, maybe you just slept all day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, is the case. Because he goes downstairs, he sees his sister, and he goes, oh, yeah, what day is it? And she says, yeah, it's the following day. You've been gone. Uh, I assume you were sleeping. But it's not a big deal. She doesn't make any issue over it because a lot of times he'll just go to sleep in his study, and he won't see her for days just because he's so into his work. So she didn't think anything of it. He slept or was out of his body for a whole day. And that's the big shocking conclusion of that chapter, <laughs> mm-hmm. which gets us into five, the thing in the pit. Now, this next, f- these next few chapters are pretty exciting. Yeah. Now, this is uh, my favorite part of the book by far, this next few chapters. <laughs> so this chapter, he mentions that his house is surrounded by this huge estate, uncultivated gardens just growing wildly around it. And then at the back about 300 yards away is this deep ravine that the people in the village call the pit. And down at the bottom, there's this stream that you can hear, but you can't really see because of all the, it's so overhung by tree. I want to bring up a point here. Mm -hmm. Now, in the beginning of the story, this house was out on the precipice. Right. In his description of it, it's not on a precipice. There's a ravine that's kind of a ways away from the house. But there's solid ground under the house. So Exactly. (laughs) So we know something's going to happen. Now, he's out one day walking along the southern edge of this pit. And he suddenly, some shale and some rock is dislodged from the face of the cliff around this pit as he's walking, Mm -hmm. crashes down through the trees. When they go down there, it causes some disturbance at the bottom of the pit and Pepper starts freaking out as if there's somebody or something down there. And then he hears some, he says a half human, half pig-like squeal. (laughs) Right. Come up from down below and he thinks, hmm, that's pretty weird. And of course, he remembers this vision that he had of this creature. Yeah. And that freaks him out a bit. The dog keeps barking and freaking out. He goes back to his house and he gets a stick and then they actually go down right. into the ravine and they're looking around. Pepper, at one point while they're exploring the river, runs off on his own. He's out in some bushes. There's some kind of noise. We hear a pig scream as if it's been bitten or something like that. And then mm-hmm. Pepper howls, runs out of the shrubs with his tail down looking behind him. So there was some kind of conflict that happened in there. When he comes out, he's got a huge gash on the side of his chest on the dog's chest so ribs are actually almost visible yeah something messed him up and he goes in because he saw his dogs hurt and he's furious and he just goes running into there to because he thinks it's an animal or something and he's got a stick so he's going to beat it but when he runs in there he sees a humanoid shape kind of a whitish color and it moves through the woods and he tries to pursue it but he loses it now after dinner at, he's gone back to the house he's patched up pepper Mm-hmm. He's reading, kind of feels odd. He looks up suddenly and he sees something peering in the window. Yeah. Looking at him. His reaction's funny. He says, a pig by Jove. <laughs> it had a grotesquely human mouth and jaw, but with no chin of which to speak. The nose was prolonged into a snout. Thus it was that with the little eyes and queer ears gave it such an extraordinarily swine-like appearance. A forehead there was little and the whole face was of an unwholesome white color. For perhaps a minute, I stood looking at the thing with an ever-growing feeling of disgust and some fear. 
The mouth kept jabbering inanely, and once emitted a half-swinish grunt. I think it was the eyes that attracted me the most. They seemed to glow at times with a horribly human intelligence, and kept flickering away from my face over the details of the room, as though my stare disturbed it. It appeared to be supporting itself by two claw-like hands upon the windowsill. These claws, unlike the face, were of a clay-brown hue, and bore an indistinct resemblance to human hands, in that they had four fingers and a thumb, though these were webbed up to the first joint, much as are a duck's. Nails it had also, but so long and powerful that they were more like the talons of an eagle than aught else. So, yeah, that's a pretty <laughs> creepy pig monster, dude. Yeah, looking at him all creepy through the window, he stares at it, he takes a step toward the window, the thing ducks and vanishes. And he decides, oh, I'm going to find out where that thing is, and he's going to chase it off. Now, his sister, she shows up. Yeah. And she says, you know, what's going on? What happened to Pepper? And he says, well, Pepper was wounded by a wildcat. Mm -hmm. And I try to chase it out of, of the bushes. So, you know, don't worry about it. She kind of isn't sure what to make of his story. She gives him kind of a skeptical look. But he uses that same story to justify that he's going to go out and hunt around the house. He's like, that wildcat's yeah. menacing us again. So I got to go uh, find out what's going on. And he's glad, at least, that even though this thing reminds him of the pig creature from his vision, it's material horror, at least. It's something he thinks he can maybe shoot and kill her or at least deal with. He hears it scuttling away from the bushes. He hunts around and can't find this thing, so he gets back into the house and secures all the windows and doors to make sure that obviously it doesn't come in. Once he's done that later, after he's read for a while, he hears a, a noise at the door, at the back door, like something's mm -hmm. trying to get in. And even once it creaks, like somebody's trying to, to force it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Pretty creepy. It's good. It's great stuff. And then the worst part is he kind of waits for an hour listening to figure out what it is. And then he starts to hear imperceptibly the sound of what he thinks is a lot of these things. Yeah. Maybe coming out from that chasm, from the ravine. Of a distant, he says, a chorus of bestial shrieks. So it's not just one Gamorrean guard out there. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of them. And right. uh, I think that might be a good place to pause. That is a good place to pause. I think that's a good, we're, that's the end of chapter five. So we're yeah. going to be getting into chapter six. Like I said, we're going to move faster, but I think we want to take our time with this bit here because it's so great. I just love it so much. Yeah. This next thing reminded me of some Lovecraft stories. You could see the influence and had a little bit oh, of yeah. whisper and darkness in it, you know, where he's trying to kind of repel an invasion. In it, on yeah. His there's house. a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of movies that are based on the, the siege principle, you mm -hmm. know, and I felt like that this was one of the first first siege movies like i totally saw yeah. it as a movie in my head it was it's really cool yes yeah, dog soldiers or anything like that it's, yeah. it's that exact thing night of the living dead that's our introduction to house on the borderland so far so good this is the good part we're in the <laughs> right in the good part and then it gets to be in the crazy part i want to thank john hancock for doing our readings once again yes he's he's gonna be with us this whole story so i can't wait to hear his lovely voice just delivering the goods we will be back next week with more pork of july <laughs> I am uh, I'm Chad Pfeiffer. I'm Chris Lackey. <laughs> and you've been listening to the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. At HPPodcraft.com. HPPodcraft.com. <laughs>